Sustainability is just simple. It's sustain plus ability. In other words, it's just the ability to sustain what you're doing. Different people have different ideologies of how to sustain themselves. So we need to focus on what is a sustainable mechanism or what is a sustainable development. What I'm going to tell you is more of how sustainability can be uh, important in building of cities or building, of, or building your buildings. And that is where we come into what is called sustainable development. Now this is the dictionary meaning of sustainable development. What it says is it, it's, it's the development that meets what, what you need at the present, but not compromising what future generations would need, uh, for, would need for themselves. So this is a map that I think we all know. This is the world map. It looks so nice when you see it. Many people want to travel to many countries. But there are different ways of looking at this map. You could look at it like this. This is also a reality. This is in, in terms of population. Or you could also look at, look at it like this. This is also the world in reality, in terms of carbon emissions. So this is what creates the imbalance in different parts of the globe. And, and that calls for a sustainable development to happen. Just to give you some stats, I would go into my story as to what interested me into this topic. But these are the stats. The most dense cities in the world, and almost eight of them, 80%, lies in Asia, out of which 50% are Indian cities. So what this says is 80% of this development is happening in this part of the world because the other 20% is already developed to a certain level. Now the way we choose to develop our cities or our living spaces would actually define how our future generations would live or what difficulties it, it would or what difficulty difficulties they would face. This is just some growth stats of India itself. You have the population as a red line. The Purple line indicates the population increase in rural areas and the green one in urban areas. What interests me is if you look at 2001 to 2011, the rural population has increased only 10%, while the urban population has jumped 30%. Now that's a span of the last 10 years. And this trend will only increase. A prediction is that there will be a 50% rise in urban population by 2025 in India. And that gives us a major concern. I think we are not new to witnessing situations like this in our cities. And we complain about it. I, I complain so many times about the traffic. And, and something like this, which comes in everyday newspaper. We ha are having the most polluted air. What is the reason? for having this kind of a situation. It's transportation networks, buildings, and electricity. Contrary to popular belief that CO2 or emissions are coming majorly from transports, the silent killers are actually buildings. Buildings use electricity. We have to use electricity for our living. Now, how is electricity generated? That is the source of the real pollution. 60% of electricity that is generated in India comes from coal. And coal emits gases. I, I was in Vienna recently. And I found out that 60% of their electricity needs come from renewable sources, of which 50% is from hydro. And 30% is from uh, wind power. So, Similar cases like India is existing in China, in the Philippines, in Indonesia, in Myanmar, and all of these burgeoning Asian cities which are set to become developed in the next 20 to 25 years. So our focus has to be on how we can address this problem in developing Asia. Then how do you do sustainable growth? 
So I was at BMS and doing mechanical engineering about seven years ago. And it is at that juncture, I, I think a lot of final year students here could be in the same position. What next? Do we have a placement process? So it will directly get us into an industry. I have seen many mechanical engineers going to software industry, electrical engineers going into software industry. And the question when I ask them is to why you don't go into the field of your own uh, choice or, or, or rather a, a field of your profession, what, what you're being trained for. They give me the answer, you have a better job there. It pays you better. I recently met a software engineer who joined Ola Caps. He says, I can go into a placement program which pays me 30,000 rupees a month. I drive a cab, it pays me 60,000 a month. So I think there is a, an imbalance in the, in the way the structure is. Why would a trained software engineer go into an Ola cab? Or why would a mechanically trained person fit, fit into a software industry? Because usually people complain later on. So you have to make investments in building innovative strategies of sustainable growth in every domain. And that would, in a sense, so ease the problem to, to a certain extent. So I was working at this company after passing out of BMS college. And I worked for a year here. And I was thinking, what can I do next? Either I get into a mechanical company. I mean, the software option is always there. But nothing was very enterprising, or nothing was really uh, getting that gut feeling in me that, yes, this is what I want to do. So I attended a conference in Mumbai. And there I met a professor from the National University of Singapore. I was very intrigued by what he presented. He presented something similar. And this is what was coming in the newspapers during those days. And this was a problem that we were seeing. So I talked to him, and, and he told me, yes, why don't you come over to Singapore if you're interested in this field? And that took me to Singapore to do work in sustainable design. So from a mechanical engineering graduate, I kind of shifted slowly towards architectural engineering. Now what I saw in Singapore, I mean a developed city. Many of us may have visited there. You enjoy the shows there the cleanliness, it's a very nice city. But there's another side to that city. It is this picture. You have air conditioning inside, but once you come outside, when you step outside, you see all these boxes hanging around in almost every building in Singapore. Now this creates another problem, which is called as the urban heat island effect. It basically heats up the microclimate. And that's why if you live in Singapore for a, a, a longer duration, duration, say like a month or so, you would actually complain, why is the city so hot? There is a lot of research that's being done to make the city cooler. There are many projects, many grants, and this is a rising problem. So the, the question you need to ask, really, is this was going through my mind during my course at NUS when I was doing research as to why am I doing what I am doing? That is the critical question. And what impact is my work having in improving conditions outside? And the third one is what larger problem am I solving? I think these are the three key questions that came to my mind when I was during, do, doing my course in Singapore. And that is when some guys from Some guys came from, um, from Switzerland. And we were actually uh, doing one project uh, for an award competition. So we created some design strategies for building, building, uh, for building buildings in a better way. So this was one of the buildings that we built. We used strategies which resembled ancient techniques of cooling. And we operated wind, wind models and others to build the buildings. So these Swiss guys came over and they told me, 
we have a project that's going on in Switzerland. Why don't you come over? And why we can teach you about that. So I went to Switzerland. This is the famed Monterosa hut in the on the Zermatt in the Zermatt area on the Monterosa mountain. And this is the first zero emission building in the world. Now I was amazed at this building, the way they build it. It works independently of any Swiss electricity or any, any grid connections or anything at all. It, it generates everything on itself. So while I was working in Switzerland, I got this idea. Why don't we put the same thing into practice in Singapore? Let's see how it works in Asia. If it can work in Europe, it can work in Asia. But what is the change that you need to bring? So we went to Singapore, we had a grant, and nobody was giving us a space, because Singapore is a space, it has a space crunch. So we actually bought two containers. We thought we would set up our own lab. So we bought these containers, because containers are basically available for free in Singapore. It's the biggest container transit hub. And we created some of these technologies, we replicated them, what we used in Switzerland. We built it ourselves using uh, your own hands, so I learned a lot of real-time plumbing, electrical, and all of that, installing some glazings, and then covering it up with a canopy. So we called it the Bubble Zero. This is how it looked. So this is the lab we created to create the first zero emission prototype in Asia. What we did is, this is the conventional approach. If you have a building, you can put in a glass there, and it could have an energy consumption which is this much. Can we achieve the same energy consumption with this huge glass? Now that's the challenge. And that is where sustainable strategies come into practice, because you have to develop this technology. Now this technology should be developed at, at, at a cost which is not too much different from the market price. So that is the challenge we faced. And we had a, a project, uh, another project in Singapore who, who actually allowed us to uh, use this kind of a prototype into a new building. So we, we got these uh, kind of uh, balls which we placed in, in concrete slabs. So this actually reduces the amount of concrete that's going into the building. I have seen so many people all over the globe pouring concrete into their slabs, probably about 10 inches thick or 12 inches thick, but this could actually reduce that concrete by almost 70%. So these are some of the st sustainable strategies that we developed in Singapore to create this new model. And we converted a two-floor building into a three-floor building without actually compromising on any of the thermal comfort parameters. After the PhD was done, I thought, what next? Can I actually build this technology or whatever uh, zero emission design that I've learned? Can I upscale it you know, into designing projects? Now the problem with entrepreneurship is nobody is willing to be the first person to invest in you. I think some entrepreneurs here would kind of agree with me. So it, the first client is always your most important client because he trusts you in your technology. So we got this one Chinese client in Wuhan, and this was the building he was developing. It was the corporate headquarters of Hoxim Cements, which is the uh, alternate name for Holcim, the biggest cement manufacturer in the world. And we told him, we can do this building in a different way. So my aim uh, in my company was to build and design buildings differently to what was being developed. In Wuhan, what we did is, it's, it's a place which is highly humid in summers and winters get really cold. So if the client could actually save on his electricity bills for heating and cooling, then he would be interested in what I'm selling him. So what we told him was, we can do this heating and cooling for free. Now, when you mention free to anybody in this world, they would be interested, <laughs> you know? So the, uh, the concept that we came out with was to dig boreholes, very deep boreholes, 120 meters deep, because the soil temperature here 
at 120 meters is really hot. It's about 30 degrees Celsius. And the soil temperature here at about 50 to 70 meters is about 22 to 23 degrees Celsius. So what we did is drill these boreholes, pass water through them, and you use the, uh, the temperature here of the soil in, in, the wind, uh, in, the, in, the, in the winters to heat up the building and use the temperature here to cool the building in uh, summers. So the client was really interested and when I talk to him now, he actually thanks me for using this technology. Although there was a lot of apprehension from his side to be the first to do it, what if it fails, what if it doesn't work? But this works now. And there are a lot of buildings in China which actually are using this kind of a technology for, you, uh, for heating and cooling their buildings. Another project that we did was in Indonesia. Uh, this was an island resort that we did. And all the material that we used on this building project were recycled material. So that was uh, another important thing about this project where we used starting from your wood until your taps and, and, and all of the water and everything was recycled. So this was another project we did. There was a project in uh, Jakarta that we did where we, where, where we used tap system and underflow cooling. So we kind of used these kinds of uh, technologies to achieve the same result. Then we are, we are currently doing this project in Bangalore. It's, it's the Radisson Hotel, which was formerly known as the Atria Hotel. And our challenge here is to reduce the electricity bill of the client by half. Currently, the client pays about 17 lakh rupees of electricity bill per month. Now, our challenge is to get that down to almost 8 lakhs. Our target is to make this hotel, the five-star hotel, the most energy efficient five-star hotel in India. So, what I'm saying is when you follow your passion of doing what you like, it could start off uh, in, not, in, in not such a favorable way. You'll have to go through challenges, but then we can really kick off and clients will be interested in investing in your idea and concept. This is an, uh, these are some of the other projects that we are doing. We are, this is again a green home. It's a villa project, which is coming up uh, on the outskirts of Devanhalli. And we are planning to make this each villa self-sustainable. So it does not use any electricity from the grid, but generates the electricity that it needs on itself. Our uh, hallmark project was this zero energy building that we did in, in Bangalore on the 100 feet road in Indranagar. Some of you may have seen this when you pass by this road. And it is the first sustainable store that Puma has in the world. You can read about it on, on the website of Puma. What we did was we used these solar photovoltaics to generate electricity again. So this is a net zero energy building. What is net zero is the building does not consume any energy over a period of one year. The, the solar panels are connected to the grid and when the power is generated, the electricity is supplied into the main grid. And when the power uh, development is low, the power is then tapped off from the main grid. I think in Karnataka, the government here offers the highest rates for rooftop solar photovoltaics, 9.5 rupees per kilowatt, which is even more than 9 rupees per kilowatt what you pay as your commercial electricity bill. So the potential to generate solar power in a, in a state that is deficit of power is very high. And that is why solar photovoltaics is actually catching a trend. For the dinner, which some of you may be coming with us to the KSCA stadium, that is totally solar powered now. So if you go to the rooftop of the KSCA stadium, you can actually see that the whole roof is solar photovoltaic. So they want to make the electricity consumption of this building totally dependent on solar. There's another Cochin airport, some of you may have learned. It's the first airport in the world which is solar powered and totally solar powered. And the ROIs today is only about five years. So I think a net zero kind of a building, if we could install in 
in numbers in our cities that could actually solve the problem that we saw first, that the Delhi air is most polluted. One reason are, are these buildings which are adding to that pollution work. This is another master plan that uh, we just uh, inked the deal in Tanzania, in Dar es Salaam. We are still negotiating with the client to make this resort. It's, it, it's, it's a casino kind of a resort on the Indian Ocean uh, to be the first uh, master planned uh, development to be self-sustainable or zero energy. Now, if this happens, this could be the first one for Eastern Africa. And I think if we can, if we can promote such concepts in the long run, in 30 or 40 years time, we could have our world a better place to live, where we have abundance of energy, but we are not greedy to use that energy. So this is what I think is easiest to do, is do what you like. It's easier said than done, but if you actually follow and if you're confident in yourself, you can actually do and achieve whatever you like. Else, there is always the easiest option of like what you do. Oops. During this journey of mine, I also came across this organization called as ASHRAE. It's, it's a global organization and we promote standards, we promote good practices, we promote certifications. So what ASHRAE taught me was network me with other people who think similar to me or people who are passionate about what they're doing or they're innovating something or they are on uh, research projects which could actually bring about a change. So this is just something that I am mentioning. If some of you may be interested, you could have a look. We do a lot of uh, leadership weekends. We, given, uh, we give out a lot of grants for, for projects, for startups and stuff. So if anybody may be interested in a startup or, or you have a proposal, you could write to ASHRAE and there are a lot of grants that are given out by ASHRAE. I'm associated with ASHRAE on uh, some projects and some projects which have received grants. And we are having one leadership uh, workshop in Goa next month. So it's, it's a global event that we are having something similar to this where we have people from about 10 countries visiting and it's, it's a two-day workshop on uh, what is more about ASHRAE, the grant calls and leadership training, entrepreneurial training and, and things like that. So it's happening from December 11 to 13. If some, some of you may be interested, you could actually register for the event or I could tell you more about it uh, during the concluding sessions. These are just some photographs of the previous events that we had. So what next is on my mind, apart from the consulting and all the projects that I do, is also the research part. Because I don't want to go away from research. If you go into industry, there's a strong tendency that you shift away from research. So I'm currently working uh, currently and for the future with this uh, company, a spin-off from ETH called as Climeworks. And we're developing this machine. So this is a prototype basically which we developed. We would be installing this in, 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 a, in a building in Switzerland. And this is a cross section of it. It's a CO2 absorbing machine. So if this machine is actually successful in a building, this could revolutionize the way buildings are ventilated. And uh, so this is one project that I'm working on. Another project is the solar HCPV technology. Like I was mentioning about solar, your current panels, what is available in the market is about 11 to 14% efficient because that's the monocrystalline film. Or the now this new technology, which is uh, embedded, uh, it has its first embedding in uh, Lawrence Berkeley lab in Berkeley. This can produce up to 43% efficiency of conversion from solar to electricity. So this is, I think, a promising uh, uh, technology to be a part of. And these are just some installations that have happened. So these are some research topics that I'll be working on. So I think if you can act, you can definitely influence the way people think 
and then the world could be a better place to live in. Thank you.